Hey, you're listening to Clumsy Theosis, a Catholic podcast that explores topics within the Catholic faith to help us deepen our spiritual lives, own our relationship with the Lord, and strengthen His church. Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited that you're here today listening to the Clumsy Theosis podcast. We are a 100% listener-supported show, and with that in mind, I would like to ask you if you have ever found any benefit from this show, if you would please consider donating to Clumsy Theosis. All you have to do is go to clumsytheosis.net and then click the word donate in the menu, or you can go down to your show notes which is where you would read the summary for this episode, and there is also a link for you down there. If you do, you will be among great people like Paul. Paul is our most recent donor, so thank you, Paul. If you don't know who I am, my name is Rochelle Lucero, and I'm the host of this show. Every week, I send out an email with the most recent episode as well as some insider information. Get on that list and make sure that you never miss another episode of this show. And the link to get on that list is down in the show notes also. So, it is voting time again here in the wonderful U.S. of A. And it is just going to be the most delightful time, isn't it? (sighs) Before you get the wrong idea about this episode, I will not be talking about politics or Catholic slash moral issues that arise in politics. That is just not what we're going to be talking about. Today, we're going to be going over a very specific word, a word that the Catholic world, at least here in America, throws around a lot every four years around this time, and that word is conscience. Tell me if I'm wrong here. You will find articles in Catholic publications, blog posts circulating online, as well as pamphlets in the back of your churches, and even booklets and guides that are for sale that have the words Catholic conscience, either in their title or as their prominent theme. And then, and then, here's the crazy part, we don't hear about conscience until the time of our next election or unless there is some sort of bill or law that arises that we need to vote on. And that makes no sense to me, right? If a topic such as conscience is so important that it is stressed during times like this when we're called upon to make big decisions, then maybe it's such a big deal that we should be talking about it more often and not just in the realm of making political decisions. Maybe, just maybe, the conscience has a broader reach. Maybe it can also affect our sacramental life, as well as our relationships with God and with other people in the world. I'm just saying, it's a possibility. The first thing that we read in the Catechism about conscience is this. All right, starting in paragraph 1776, we read, Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he has to obey. Its voice, ever calling him to love and to do what is good and to avoid evil, sounds in his heart at the right moment. For man has in his heart a law inscribed by God. His conscience is man's most sacred core and his sanctuary. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depths. Now, this sounds a lot different from the caricatures that conscience has been kind of turned into in our culture. And the most notable among those is the angel and the devil that hover over our shoulders, whispering into our ears, trying to influence us to do things their way, right? And of course, we cannot forget the well-dressed talking cricket from Pinocchio, the endearing Jiminy Cricket. These images are amusing and I love them. They're from my childhood, but they can deceive us into thinking about the conscience and its formation as only applying to children, right? But that could not be farther from the truth. For example, in the course of a day, how often would you say that you go with your gut or you follow your heart or you do what feels right to you or maybe you're listening to your intuition? Now, many people associate these internal sensations with the conscience, but is it really the conscience? Uh, I mean, maybe yes and maybe no. And I'm sure that that sounds confusing to you, so don't worry. I'm definitely going to go over that before we end today. But I think the better question 
you know, not whether or not this is the conscience. The better question is, should we be using our conscience in those moments when we feel like we have to go with our gut or follow our heart or, or, you know, or so on? Should we be activating our conscience? And in most of those instances, probably yes. Now, to find out if you are actually using your conscience when you are supposed to, and, and I think this is the kicker, if you're actually using your conscience well, let's start by breaking down the etymology of the conscience or the word conscience. Now, raise your hand if you are like me, and when you write out the word conscience in your head, you say, con science. If that is you, you are actually splitting the word etymologically correctly. That's not a real term, by the way. Um, Conscience is con and science. Con means with or through, and science means to know, or a deeper meaning is to divide or to make distinctions. Therefore, the conscience means to thoroughly know something, or better yet, to thoroughly make distinctions between things. Catechism paragraph 1778 defines conscience as a judgment of reason whereby the human person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act. So two things here. First, to recognize the moral quality of something is to make thorough distinctions about the goodness or the evil of the action, right? And that echoes the etymology that we just went over. The second thing, We read that the conscience is a judgment of reason. What does that mean? All right, well, with reason, it is often misunderstood. A lot of times we think that reason is just having a thought, right? We think reason happens in our head, in our mind, in our thoughts. And so if we think it, we've reasoned it, and it is reasonable. But reason is actually the process of attaining the truth, right? Process. It is a function of your mind, meaning it has steps and stages. You know, reason sorts through the facts and the thoughts that you have with the goal. The goal is always to end up at the truth. Truth is bigger than your thought because the origin of truth is God, okay? And so this brings me to my next point. Where does the conscience come from? Make no mistake about it. Your conscience is yours. It is within you. You know, remember that quote, that said that the conscience is man's most secret core and his sanctuary. But also remember that that same quote tells us that within his conscience, man is alone with God. The voice of God echoes within the depths of man, meaning that your conscience is not solely about you. God is present. He's waiting to teach and to form you, okay? Now, in order for any of that to happen, In order for you to hear God's voice in your conscience, you need to have an interior life, which is to have a spiritual life, a life of prayer, where you don't just talk to God or talk at God, but you're actually hearing him. The beauty of conscience is that everyone has it, okay? St. Cardinal Henry Newman, I think he's a saint. I'm pretty sure he's a saint. He referred to the conscience as the, quote, Aboriginal Vicar of Christ, which is to say that the conscience is the original, it's the first to stand in the place of Christ and to possess his authority. And that's because God has written his law there in your conscience, right? On your heart. And that is really huge. Now, because the conscience is considered the Aboriginal Vicar of Christ, it's given pride of place. Now, what that means is that our faith requires that every man be able to use his freedom and follow his conscience in all moral issues. Now, you might be able to understand how this teaching is the cause of controversy, and that's because it is so easily abused. You have folks justifying living life contrary to the faith by using the word conscience all the time. I know, I used to do it, you know, I'm just going with my conscience, I'm doing what feels right, yada, 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 okay? But really, are those people using their conscience? Most likely not, because from my personal experience, the false reasoning that goes on in the minds of those who are abusing this teaching about conscience, it goes a little something like this. I desire this, I want this, I like to do this. And I'm a good person and I don't want to hurt anyone. Therefore, what I want to do is also good and it won't hurt anyone either, including myself and God. 
Okay, now remember that conscience is the judgment of reason in order to attain the truth. Okay, was there any truth seeking in that so called reasoning process? No. Was there any thorough distinctions made between what is good and what is evil in that process? No, not at all. Okay, and this is where the formation of conscience comes into play. Remember when I asked you earlier about following your conscience and if it was the same as um, going with your gut or following your heart, listening to your intuition or, or doing what feels right to you, right? And then I answered by saying that maybe it is and maybe it's not. Okay, well, I want to explain that now. This harkens back to the aboriginal vicar of Christ. Now, when these things are stirred within us, a spark ignites, um, and that's kind of indicating that there is a decision to be made about the goodness or the rightness of something. You know, it's kind of like the aboriginal vicar of Christ within us has been alerted. So in that sense, yes, your conscience has been poked, right? It is, it has been alerted to the fact that it needs to get to work and do its job. But I also say no, because we can have our conscience alerted to the fact that we need to engage with it, but then we can jump to a conclusion without actually having reasoned anything out and making thorough distinctions between what we are considering and comparing that to an objective standard rooted in the truth according to God. And so in those instances, no, we have not actually utilized our conscience. So therefore, it's super easy to abuse this belief that we have in our faith about always following your conscience. Here's a catch-22. Did I say catch-22? I did. What I really mean is caveat. This is a caveat to the rule about always following your conscience. And for today, I'm including terms like your gut, your heart, um, the things that feel right and your intuition, I'm including those, I'm lumping them in with conscience because like I said, a lot of people do that subconsciously when they're talking about their conscience. Let's not let that get confusing. (laughs) Um, All right, so even though everyone always has to follow their conscience, we are all responsible for forming our own consciences because if we don't, the conscience can remain in ignorance and it can make bad and even wrong judgments. And because we were the ones who neglected to form our own consciences, we can be held responsible for the wrongs that we commit, even if we are in ignorance. And that's a little scary. But God is merciful. And if we are honestly working on the legitimate formation of our conscience, then there is no need for us to worry, okay? God is not big and mean and bad and scary like that, right? He just wants you to work at forming your conscience, at being able to hear his voice within you, okay? And when I say the formation of conscience, I mean we are educating our conscience. In Catechism, paragraph 1784, that actually reminds us that the education of the conscience is a lifelong task. So no matter how old you are, no matter how much you know, there is still more for you to learn when it comes to the formation and the education of your conscience. So how do we do this? If we're supposed to do this for our whole lives, how do we form our conscience? Well, again, the catechism gives us some good pointers. And it tells us actually point blank in paragraph 1785, it says that the formation of conscience, oh, sorry, in the formation of conscience, the word of God is the light for our path. We must assimilate it in faith and prayer and put it into practice. Basically, read your Bible, pray, also known as talking about what you read in your Bible with God, right? And let him answer you back. Let him show you and and give you the grace as well to make all of the things that you're reading in the scriptures and you're learning about the scriptures to make them a part of your personal life and your personal faith. Now, I'm also going to give you a little bit of a checklist for times when you are faced with decisions that require you using your conscience, which is uh, probably a lot more than you realize, okay? Now, use those little um, sparks that are triggered within you, you know, when you feel like you have to follow your heart or go with your gut or, you know, listen to your intuition. Use those little sparks there as uh, triggers to tell you that maybe I should really be using my conscience right now. And when I use my conscience, I'm going to ask myself these two important questions. Okay, the first question you ask yourself is, does this go against God's revelation? Now, remember that God's revelation is what God has revealed to humanity. Sometimes it's called divine revelation, which refers to whatever you read in the scriptures and whatever is held as our sacred tradition. And then the second thing that you ask is, does this go against church teaching? 
Okay, remember, the church has been given the protection of the Holy Spirit to safeguard the truth and to make sure that everything that God has given us in divine revelation, to make sure that all of all of that revelation that God has given us, to make sure that it is applied correctly to the things that we actually have to deal with in our lives here as humans on earth, okay? Especially, especially when they apply to things about our faith and morals, okay? If you are deliberating about anything and anything goes against either of those two questions or anything goes against God's revelation or it goes against the teaching of the church, it is a no-go. You might not agree and you might not understand why, you know, the church says something or why God says something, but as a member of the Catholic Church, your conscience is called to assent to the teaching of what God has revealed to us through divine revelation as well as how those divine revelations are applied to the issues of faith and morals, which the church has had to explain to us, okay? Then, once you have said, okay, fine, I don't agree or I don't understand, but I'm going to go with it, you know, I'm going to to do what the faith and or what God says, then it is your responsibility to learn, to study, and to find out why does God say that this thing is not good or that it is good, or why does the church reason that this action is not good or that it's good, okay? It is your responsibility to find out the truth. This is actually a very big part of forming your own conscience. And it's probably the number one thing that is neglected when it comes to the formation of conscience. So please don't be that person. I'm trying really hard not to be that person either, okay? Let's pray for each other to form our conscience as well. Um, Some other ways that we can form our conscience. One is obviously a no-brainer because the catechism basically spelled it out for us. It said, read your Bible, okay? So we know that read our Bible and pray and learn (laughs) learn from God about what our Bible teaches us. Um, Second, do a daily examination of conscience. I don't have an episode or resource on that, but I do have a resource, which is a really good examination of conscience before confession, and I'll link that down in the show notes. Three, consume Catholic media, things like this podcast, for instance, that are going to help to form and shape your conscience. Um, Fourth, study the faith. Learn as much as you can about the faith. And fifth, this is the last thing I'm going to suggest, and that would be to use your conscience. You have to use your conscience in order for it to flourish. And every time you have those little triggers, you know, when you feel like you have to go with your gut or follow your heart or your intuition and so on, use those as triggers to alert you to the fact that you really got to, you know, hone in on your conscience in those moments and ask yourself those two checklist questions that I gave you a little bit earlier. And I'm going to leave you with this great, beautiful quote from the Catechism, which I find very inspiring. In paragraph 1776, it says that when you listen to your conscience, the prudent man can hear God speaking. Basically, when you tap into your conscience, it's an instance of prayer. And if you do this at all those moments when you feel those little triggers throughout the day, you're going to have all these extra moments when you're praying and communing with God, which is beautiful. All right, if you liked any of the quotes that I used in today's episode, those are down in the show notes for you also. Go down and check out everything that's down there for you. Once again, my name is Rochelle Lucero with Clumsy Theosis. You can find me online at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Clumsy Theosis. And you can always find me on my website, clumsytheosis.net. Until next week, beef up those consciences. Peace out. Thank you for tuning in to Clumsy Theosis. I'm so happy that you've been able to hang out. If you want to learn more about Clumsy Theosis, you are more than welcome to visit my website, clumsytheosis.net. From clumsytheosis.net, you will also be able to contact me if you're interested in booking me as a speaker or if you're just feeling generous and you'd like to make a donation. Remember that together we can transform the world by letting the Lord transform us.